This is People and Their Poems, a podcast about the poems that make a difference in our world. In each episode, writer and educator Sandy Carlson talks with a person who has been influenced by poetry and become a poet or a supporter of this literary form. Stay tuned. Welcome to People and Their Poems podcast, a podcast about the local poets and the poems that matter to them. I'm here today with Tom Nicotera. Welcome, Tom. Uh, thank you. Pleased to be here. Uh, um, I'm so glad you have you have time to talk with us today. You've got uh, quite a rich background in the world of poetry as a, as a teacher, as an organizer of public events in Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Connecticut, as a former coordinator of the Wittenberry Poetry seri- Series out of Bloomfield Library, uh, editor of anthologies, and somebody who has worked with the... Um, Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts and uh, the American School for the Deaf here in Connecticut. So you bring a vast array of experience and writing experience, uh, writing experiences to the conversation. And so that is that is some of your background. But would you introduce yourself to our listeners as a poet? I started out writing poetry when I was a physics major at Garfield University. This was in the late '60s, early '70s. I graduated in 1971. And I found I was writing poems in my physics notebooks. And I, I had an English, we had, everybody had to take English literature, British literature, even the science majors. And the, the professor had us read all kinds of poetry and I really got excited about it. About it. And I decided to change my major to uh, English because I was writing so much poetry. Of course, I then had a poem published in the Fairfield University Journal. And then I moved to D- D.C. I, I started working. The first job out of college was a water sewer repairman. And I was even writing poems in the truck during lunchtime. <laughs> and I taught some uh, classes there. This is in Atlantic City area. It was in Bentner, New Jersey. And I moved to Washington, D.C. to get a master's in literature at American University. And that's when I started teaching workshops there. And I I ran, I had this group called Second Wind Poets, these including Charlie Rossiter, that's where I met him from Bennington now, and uh, Robert Farr, a couple of other people. We decided to produce a jazz poetry day and the Lincoln Memorial grounds in Washington, D.C. at the Sylvan Theater. And we had to get the blessings of the National Park Service but we combined poetry readings, alternated them with jazz groups performing. And then I ran a poetry series. I moved to Tacoma Park, Maryland, just outside of DC. And I was a co-op member of a food co-op. And rather than putting hours at the store, I said, I'll run a poetry series for you at their cafe. And that was the Tacoma Cafe Poetry Series. And I met a, um, an old beat poet called Charlie Plymel, I don't know if you know him, but he wrote a book called The Last of the Moccasins about his, he knew Jack Kerouac and Ginsburg and all this. So he said, how would you like to have Herbert Hunky read? And if for be- people who are familiar with the beats, he was in a lot of their, a lot of Kerouac's novels. Um, and he had just published a book of his experiences called The Evening Sun Turned Crimson. And I had him. It's a feature. It drew a huge crowd of people, all these lovers of beat literature. And I had Charlie Plymel there and several other people. And I, I love performance poetry. I had an Irish musician who did poetry. Um, I had a storyteller poet. I really got the, you know, I firmly believe that poetry should be presented well orally, not just the written word. And so I adopted a performance style of poetry, memorizing a lot of poems and uh, performing them. Uh, I perform, I have a baran, which I took lessons when I was 46 from an Irish musician, probably how to play the baran, and uh, harmonica, I'll combine that. And when I moved to Connecticut, I met uh, two poets, Terry Klein and Victoria Munoz, and we formed a performance poetry trio and we did a lot of performance uh, poetry around the state. And around, I also, when I moved up here, I began a poetry series in Granby at Susan's Cafe, which doesn't exist anymore. 
And I was just learning to connect with poets. I had just moved up here in 1986. I was working for an accounting firm as their reports department editor. Not a conducive atmosphere for poetry, believe me. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, but I would go out in the courtyard on uh, my lunch break and write poetry. So I couldn't get away from it. And when I, I moved up here, the Charter Cultural Center under Tony Keller, their director at the time, had a poetry thing called the Poetry Exchange. And it was once a month at lunchtime. And I decided to go to it. And I started meeting poets from the area, various people. And it's really amazing once you start connecting. Like Sandy, I love connecting with you that, that we met at that reading at the Cheshire Land Trust. I want to say that. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong about the full title. But it's amazing how there is this community of poets in Connecticut. And that once you get here and start going to readings, and, and this is what I love about open mics, the democracy of poetry, that you can start meeting people and hooking up with them and talking with them. So it sounds like to me for you that that the poetry is a very social experience, that social has has a place in the, in the in the public arena, that we really shouldn't just be sitting home pouring over books of poetry, but but hearing them and hearing the the music of of the language as well as the the ideas or the emotions being explored through that language. That's correct. And and although I, I love doing readings on Zoom because I don't have to get dressed up, but I do miss that social connection when we had the Wintonbury readings live. We had a we used to get about 30 or 40 people mm -hmm. that drove there and we'd have maybe 20 people for the open mic. What I loved about it was we'd have a break between the two features and the open mic about 15 minutes. And the conversations that bubbled up there were amazing to me. I would eventually, to get people to stop talking, pick up my bra and play a few <laughs> notes on it. That'd make me play it down. <laughs> yeah, the power of the Irish drum. That's amazing. And did you find in these, these conversations that would emerge at these readings, is it solely about poetry or... Or did it go off road or really get, capture the topics of the poetry? What were people interested in who, who gathered to listen and to talk afterward? Well, this is the thing that I find interesting about this. Everybody reads their poetry, but when they get together, they don't talk about poetry per se or technique or anything like that. They talk about the meaning of the other person's poems and how it affected them. I mean, this is what poetry should do. It's not about technique as much as about meaning, which is one of the things I loved about Walt Whitman, which has got me started writing poetry, reading his poetry. He has, he has some things where people said, sorry, myself, my God, he needs an editor. Look how long it is. But he doesn't. He used the words he needed to say, and there was so much meaning in there. And this is what I liked about the gatherings at Open Mic, listening to the conversations you never know where the conversation was between people would spin off to. Um, they may say, oh, I really like your poem about, about, about God and nature. And then they start talking about right. the nature of God. Right. <laughs> it, it really, really is profound. And when we consider the origins of poetry as an oral public form that built community, that makes perfect sense. And it's a really great source of, of hope for all of us. So that sort of the democratizing impact of, of poetry, but also, you know, like you, I've been at open mic events and you hear a range of, of styles, uh, topics, the whole thing. And there may be people who are exploring a topic in a way you wouldn't or, uh, but that poetic disagreement, it takes place in the realm of art and it, and it becomes ultimately constructive and creative rather than destructive in a world that's so bound by the Twitter sphere and, and character counts and all this nonsense that is so un unnecessary when people are being authentic in their communication. Yeah, it's it's very um, moving. You hit the nail on the head correctly is the interconnectedness of people through poetry. One of the most beautiful things at an open mic is when somebody would come up to me, come up to the open mic and say, I'm really nervous. I've never read my poems publicly before. And then they would read them. 
And then afterwards, people come up to them and say, oh, I really like this part of your, about your poetry and so on. And then they would come back the next week, uh, and, and next month rather, and they'd become part of the regular audience. And after I quit the series, I, had, I got emails from several people saying they thanked me for welcoming them to the world of poetry at the open mics, that it was an open, welcoming atmosphere. Uh, and I think it's so important to uh, to have that open arms approach. I, I, I totally agree with you. And, you, you know, I, I've encountered people who see it as the more sort of elitist form of, of literature, the least accessible. And yet there are open mics um, all over the state, all over the country, you know, and and always, always welcoming. I don't think I've had an experience of a poetry reading where anybody felt judged or cast out or um, less than the next person who was reading. Right. Tom, would you share with yeah. uh, with our listeners a, a poem that that's been important to you as a poet? And I'm I'm, I'm really st stunned and I'm, I'm moved by the, I, the 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 revelation, the discovery that you shared with us that that poetry really changed the trajectory of your life from a very early age as a as a college student. Even, you know, even to the point of taking jobs that you might not love so that you could fund your art by, by, by creating. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, I would love to read that Walt Whitman poem. And this is called When I Heard the Learned Astronomer. And it's, it's not a long poem. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them. When I, sitting, heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time, looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Sounds somewhat biographical, Tom. <laughs> uh, it is. <laughs> you know, what I love about the poem is that contrast he, he has between the science, matter of fact, the science world, and then there's a whole other aspect of the world, the, the mysterious part of it, the mystical part of it, that can't always be explained by science. and. You know, for me, this is the part of, of spirit, which is very important to me. I was raised Catholic. That's a different God to me. <laughs> this is a, a part of the spirit that I think Whitman was saying was in everything. And that we needed to go, go out into that world, out under the stars, remove ourselves from the lecture room, and just in perfect silence, gaze at the stars which I do a lot. <laughs> well, that's that's amazing. And, you know, I woke up this morning and I have two little dogs and I brought them outside and I was I was stunned by the sort of the post-holiday silence of the January morning because it's been so mild. The, the leaves were moist. They weren't crunchy the way they can be in January. And it was almost like the dogs were tiptoeing on the leaves to protect the silence. The poem is really, for me right now, it's serendipitous because I'm hearing charts, diagram, add, divide, measure, these heavy, heavy words. And yet the poem ends with mystical and stars, these these lovely words that take you off the page and lift your eyes up in a, in, into the heavens. Yeah, and it goes from sitting in a lecture room listening to the measurable, what is being measured, to going outside to, you know, experiencing what can't be measured. And I, I think it's a a beautiful poem, a tremendous poem. But by the way, I'm, I have to add that that's one of the things I like about a lot of your poems that I read in your book is this experience, this kind of um, transformative power of experience in nature. You know, I see that in a lot of your poems. Oh, th thanks, Tom. You know, and I was I was noticing that in in your book, what better place to be than than here? That is so beautifully written but also beautifully constructed and and i was actually it's funny enough i was thinking about the physical experience of your book um with the, the hand stitching because you have to hold the book open 
Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> your attention can't be anywhere else but with your book. And it's really a wonderful thing because in our world where you got one eye on the phone and the other on what's cooking on the stove. And, and so I surrendered to your book and I was just so taken by the poetry that is just, that builds on close observations of what's happening in nature. And, you know, back to Pat Matola's event at the Cheshire uh, Land Trust uh, in the fall with Margaret Gibson and, um, and others there. The, the poem you read with the the sound of the owls integrated into your um into your poem oh, yeah. it, it that power to observe what is happening in nature really creates a transcendent experience you know it's funny i read some bizarre article in the new york times last week where this um young fella was saying poetry is dead it's been dead be, uh, for a century because elliot killed it <laughs> you know <laughs> and he he said we um we don't know how to connect to nature anymore. And then, you know, and I, I thought of your book and um, and the precision of detail, the depth of awareness of what's happening around you in nature. And, you know, uh, the Whitman poems invites us to do that and to come away from our invented world, our egos, and, and to and invite us into yeah. the cosmos where we are a speck of dust ever so delightfully. You know, one of the things that in the Whitman poem at the last line, is he makes you feel the smallness he felt being part of nature and looking up. And I think that's sadly a humility in the face of nature is something that we've lost in our society. You know, it's conquer nature, drill here, whatever. It's not, this is why I love observing animals. I have many poems about animals is that we're just a part of it. <laughs> we're just a part of it. Yeah, and you know, even what you're saying, it, it shows up in um, the weather forecast. It's the language of war now. For for goodness sake, it's wind, rain, it's snow. It, it, nobody's out to get us. It's <laughs> anything we're out to get ourselves. We're making the mess. But this, this sort of the language of violence is, is so bizarre how it pervades even the weather, you know, and, and we feel ourselves being antagonized by our world rather than being a part of it. So I, I, I think that there's so so much hope in the fact that there are beautiful books being not only written, but but created, you know, in the, in the binding and the photography yeah. and, and the typeface and the paper choice, all of that. By the way, that'd make a good poem about the, the, ang the angry way we describe weather now. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Tom, would you would you share uh, a, a poem or two of yours so that our listeners can uh, kind of enter into the world that you observe? Sure. This is one of my performance poems, so I'll mainly do it from a memory. And it's called Why I Keep My Mullen. When I was married, I had a house in uh, a beautiful area of East Granby with my wife and daughter, Newgate Road. And right, I was right down from Newgate Prison. And... I was intrigued by this plant, and I, when I mowed the lawn, I mowed around it. I wanted to see what it would become, and it became very tall. And my wife kept saying, why are you letting that grow? Why don't you cut it down? And I wrote this poem in, my, in response. Why I keep my mullen. This mullen, why do I let it stay? Surely the neighbors will complain. Its obscene desire violates their modest turfs. But in my yard, it has free reign. A year ago, it was a humble lump of leaves, fist size and feather soft. Winter saw a bulbous corpse with leaves yellowing and limp. Then came the spring, it's green again, as if the season were a pimp. Its bearded lance grows daily till by July it fills the sky, taller than me by at least a hand, and sporting a yellow jewel crown, and beneath a narrow head, a collar of green spades turned brown. Its long lean line of green bends and twists, stroked by the sun and by the rain kissed. What soft mouth the dew must ply along its slender length, judging by how it thrives and writhes in the morning mist. Ah yes, my neighbors, their lawn so trim, so smooth, so carefully cut, all grass, no weeds, a modicum of good breeding. Surely they think I've raised a slot, that I'm too lazy for weeding. They probably tiss their 
prudish mouths as they drive by in well-groomed cars. Imagine how much more they'd kiss if they knew each night I walked under the stars. But I'd rather wake every morning and see passion raging and nurture the seeds in pods wandering in from the woods or dropped by a bluebird ringing. So let my neighbors think what they'd like. Let their gossip come stinging. Love is God in a wild fling, and passion keeps us from aging. So now you know why my mullen stays. My neighbors pick, poison, and pull their weeds as if they were pests. But for me, weeds are no longer intruders, but lusty, voluptuous guests. Oh, that's amazing. Love is God on a wild fling. Wow, wait, how did, uh, how did your audience respond to that? How did your wife respond to the poem? And did your neighbor see it? <laughs> no, they didn't see it. Um, a funny thing about this poem, at the time I thought I'd never heard anybody say the word Mullen. So I thought it was pronounced Mullen, M-U-L-L-E-I-N. That's why I started that rhyme scheme about complain <laughs> and rain. <laughs> And then a, a poet, Colin Haskins, after I did it at a reading, came up to me and said, you know, that's a great poem, but Mullen, it's Mullen, not <laughs> Mullen. <laughs> so, oh, well. <laughs> that's, that's great. It actually made me think of John Green's great essay, The Tree. You know, and he, he oh. writes about buying a, a farm in England that he just let go wild because he preferred to see nature be in charge. And it was, a, you know, in the post-war era, he grew up post-World War One, seeing his dad grow up with a perfectly manicured garden with a little orchard out back and just that, that freedom of nature. It's a lot of fun. So you, you've spoken about your poems and, and your inspiration. Could I, could I just ask about your, uh, your, your publishing history, where, where your poems can be found or read now that, now that you're not doing the Wittenberry series any longer? Can you just give us a, an insight where we could find your work? Well, um, other than um, my, my book, <laughs> Um, I had some found poems published in, uh, it was a Connecticut anthology of found poetry put out by a University of Bridgeport professor. Um, gee, Sandy, there's, there's so many I sent to. Um, Michael Charnecki did a book called, it's all about birds, uh, nature poems about birds. And I have one in there. It's an anthology about called Aaron Mind. Um, I don't know. I, you may be able to just Google me and come up with something or YouTube me. In fact, I didn't know about this, but somebody sent me, said, sent me a thing, said, you know, you're on YouTube playing your Baran and reciting a poem. And somebody filmed it, posted it on YouTube. <laughs> well, I tell you, Tom, I just Googled you and I, I found quite a collection of poetry. So I, oh. I think if our <laughs> listeners will be very glad if they search up your name, Tom Nicotera, on by Google or on YouTube, or if they if they reach out to you directly for a copy of What Better Place to Be Than Here, an amazing book. And I'll I'll post your email address in the podcast notes so that they can reach out. Thank you for Google. See, I never do that. I never <laughs> Google myself. I just focus on writing poetry. I want to mention something about the photo on my book. Sure. Um, that was taken at Ricketts Glen State Park in Pennsylvania. It's maybe about half an hour's drive from Wilkesbury, but it's in the mountains, and they have a trail that totally is a circuit around about 14 water. Oh, miles. my goodness. Yeah, it, it's just amazing. If any poet goes there, they will be inspired to write poems, I guarantee it. And I've had some, you know, mystical experiences there. It's just, it's, it's old growth forest, too. It's one of the few old growth forests left in Pennsylvania. That, that sounds amazing. So, and so thank you for enlightening us about that too, Tom. And I will just end by repeating the title of your, your book, What Better Place to Be Than Here? What a, what a tribute to what it means to, to be alive in poetry. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This has been People and Their Poems, a podcast about the poems that make a difference in our world. Be sure to check the show notes for any special links relating to this episode. If you want to learn more about the podcast, visit peopleandtheirpoems.net. Or if you want to learn more about Sandy and her work, visit sandycarlson.net. Thanks for listening.